He may be the most fascinating athlete of my lifetime. He's a compelling figure. He's an interesting man. He's also, I would tell you, I think the most gifted tennis player that I've ever seen. He can do things on a tennis court that almost no one who has ever lived has been able to do. He's got just this cachet about him, Nick does. The way he moves, the way he talks, he comes across as unbelievably self-confident. And then as I dug into it, you actually have struggled with mental health to the extent where like you actually had an alcohol and drug thing you think you had going there for a while. Is it true that you actually played in Wimbledon after you had harmed yourself or you had to wear a wrap around your arm in a tennis match because there was some self-harming going on? Australian tennis star Nick Kyrgios has admitted that he was suicidal after competing at Wimbledon in 2019. Mr Kyrgios said, I was genuinely contemplating if I wanted to commit suicide, adding that he wore a white armband during the match to cover marks of self-harm. What was the absolute rock bottom moment for you when you look back at that period? So I don't think there was one select um, moment. I think it was just all a year and a half to two years of just complete just harm. I think it was, it was, it was, it was pretty dark, to be honest. Um, it was such a hard process because I knew I was how I was feeling internally, and I didn't want to play, and I knew that I was struggling. Even just to wake up and, and go outside was was a task. I had the avatar that I had to live up to as well on the other side of it, where I had to go out there and play. I and mean, to this day, you know, just people still only really want to talk to me because, you know, Nick Kyrgios, the tennis player, the, the crazy guy who does all this crazy stuff, the talented person. And it took me a while to understand that that was just a vehicle and one way of communicating who I am as a person. I felt like I was all the time wasn't enough. It was only just about that, that guy that they saw on the court. I was self-harming and suicidal and I was partying a lot and I was drinking a lot. I was also competing at the highest level. I was in a psych ward in, in London the day before I played Nadal and they wanted me to be admitted into this place for a couple weeks and I was like I can't I have to play Rafa Nadal in Wimbledon tomorrow that's how bad it was and I was in bed and my dad sat next to me and he was full-blown crying saying I can't see my son like this anymore at the top of everything even in business the pressure that comes with that can create or exaggerate mental health issues for a lot of people I think mental health is a crisis right now in the world today. You have to want to fix it. Like I knew that it was an issue. I knew that I was causing stress on my family, my friends, everyone that cared about me. And I knew that I had to fix my habits. And it started with getting up in the morning, like something small, like going for a walk, really break it down into how am I going to just change? It's not going to happen overnight. One of the best things when I opened up about my self-harming and, and my suicidal thoughts was the amount of people that messaged me on social media that I've you know, got their numbers now, I stay in contact with, I call wow. them. Two days ago I had a foundation day in, in my hometown and there was a, over 1,200 kids in, in my like tennis center that I grew up in. Like that's what keeps me going to be honest. Like me being able to show up for two hours at a tennis center and kids are going crazy and it gets them to want to be active and play tennis and who cares about if they're good or not except the fact that they feel like they mean something for that little period of time. Like for me that success outweighs the success of winning a Grand Slam. Wow. Damn, that's, yeah, that's cool nuts. right there, man. That's yeah, super yeah. cool. So hey guys, are you frustrated with where you're at right now? Maybe stunted in your progress? Well, if you are, I wanna recommend a place for you to go called Growth Day. Growthday.com forward slash ed. It is the number one personal development app on the planet. It's got all kinds of high performance techniques in there, courses, accountability, journaling, live speeches from some of the top influencers in the world, including me. It's an overall environment to change your life. Growthday.com forward slash ed. All right, welcome back to the show, everybody. So I'm so excited about today. This gentleman that we're going to visit with, to me, he may be the most fascinating athlete of my lifetime. Um, he's a compelling figure. He's an interesting man. Um, I'd call him, you know, on the surface, he's a very complex person. We'll see you today when we talk with him. Uh, <laughs> he's also, I would tell you, I think the most gifted tennis player that I've ever seen. Talented or gifted, but between the two, he can do things on a tennis court that almost no one who has ever lived has been able to do. And he's, he's going to be an interesting conversation today about success, about what really matters, mental health, performing under pressure. Um, humility. I think you're going to see a side to him today if you're if you're familiar with him that you've never seen before. Mutual friends of ours rave about him just as a human being. So Nick Kyrgios, welcome to the show. I appreciate that, Ed. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Oh my man. So 
let's look at tennis just real quick. Although I don't want to spend a lot of time today talking about tennis. I want to talk about you as a person, but I've watched you over the years and probably like a lot of people, sometimes you frustrate me if I can be candid, mm -hmm. because I see this immensely talented and gifted man. Um, and then sometimes, I don't know if you feel this way, but there's been times where, and by the way, I root for you in every match you're in, literally every match you're in. I find myself, I don't care if it's against Djokovic, Nadal, whoever it is, I root for you. But sometimes I wonder if you're even rooting for yourself when you're out there. Mm. Is that a, a fair question to ask you? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, look, I've always had a bit of a love-hate uh, relationship with tennis. I uh, played basketball when I was a kid as well, and that was my my true passion. Um, and at 14, obviously, picked the tennis kind of journey. My parents pushed me heavily towards tennis. So I guess I never really completely loved the sport, and I didn't really have passion for it. So um, every every time I kind of stepped out, there was always a battle of being completely vulnerable and going out there and, and giving my best effort all the time. Um, even though I'm a, I'm a really sick obsession and, and I'm, I hate losing and I'm a really, I'm a true competitor, that's for sure. But tennis has always been, a, you know, not, not even my true passion. So that's been a, a hard struggle my whole career as well. What about now that you're, you're injured, you're telling me you're in a tough rehab right now. Mm -hmm. Has distance made your heart grow fonder or has this distance told you, you know what, I really like my life away from the game. And the things I'm enjoying, not having to deal with the pressure, the expectations, yeah. the haters, the whatever it is. Where are you at now? Um, oh, I still deal with the haters daily. Um, it's like I've had I've had two surgeries now in a year, and 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 as an athlete, it's it's incredibly hard because rehab's not a fun place to be. You know, it's almost harder on a day to day basis than it is playing. And when you're healthy, you know, you got to do two sessions a day, two gym sessions a day. Got to make sure your diet's good. You got to just be like really knuckling down to, to getting back to that full health but in a way it's been you know a really crucial time for my I think just as a human outside of tennis because I was from Australia and I was traveling six seven months a year away from my family um because in Australia we have barely any tournaments here so the, the rest of the tours are, are always overseas so I guess now being injured it's given me to really spend that quality time with my family um, you know, I, I felt like I hadn't seen them in the last 10 years of my life because I was always traveling, playing and and just grinding, I guess. So now it's been good to be back home and, and spending time with them and just being able to build so many other things off the court as well, which I think is so crucial for an athlete. Athletes struggle with that so much because they don't know what what else to do after they, after they finish. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's been really a challenge for me too, but I've, I've fallen in love with so many things outside of the sport of tennis. Um, and 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 just like having a conversation with you, um, you know, this would never have come if I if I wasn't injured as well. So I know it's all a bonus, and I just got to change my perspective on it all. Do you want to come back and play? Ah, uh, for sure. You know, I I definitely think I've got so much more to give, and I've got millions of fans out there who who want me to come go out there and and, and play and and try and take it to these, I guess, gods of the sport like Djokovic, like a normal guy like me, like that will go out there and, and, and give these guys a good run. And I think, um, you know, that's special. And I think I've, my body's got a little bit left and, and I feel like I've still got fire in the belly. You know, I've been putting in some hard yards the last month. So I definitely feel like I'll be back. Um, and I just, yeah, I think I just don't want my fans and, and, and everyone to expect, you know, five more years of, of this circus that, that takes the, takes the court. Yeah. I want you to tell us about top level athletics that we wouldn't know. So I'm always fascinated. You're going mm -hmm. out before a final at Wimbledon, and it's you yep. and Djokovic in the tunnel. You're both standing yep. there. It's the, yes. it's the day of. It's uh, it's a match against Nadal or just another really great player. So, mm -hmm. I mean, people don't realize this. Look, there's tennis. There's there's junior tennis. There's high school tennis. There's college tennis. Then there's all these levels of tennis. Then there's professional tennis. Then there's mm -hmm. the majors. Then there's you know getting to the quarterfinals. Then there's getting to the semifinals. You're talking about on spinning planet Earth. Yep. Really two, three, four human beings experience this at every tournament, right? Yep. What what would we not know about that, Nick? Like when you're back there in the tunnel mm -hmm. and it's you and Djokovic or warming up, tell us something we don't know about the highest level that might surprise us or some yep. insights into the top of the top. So tennis is probably the only sport in the world that so basically me and Djokovic, we were sp Wimbledon's a little bit different. So let me, let me say the US Open. So in New York, so I'm playing Daniil Medvedev. He's the number one player at the world at the time. And he's the reigning US Open champion. 
So 10 minutes before we walk out to the center court, Arthur Ashe Stadium, I think it holds like, I don't know, six, something crazy, 60,000 or something. So in front, five minutes before we're about to walk out and play in front of all those people and millions worldwide watching, me and this guy, my opponent, could be Djokovic, could be Rafa, we're all in the same locker room. So I say I shower next to these guys, like we're in the same locker room and we eat next to each other. And then we have to go out and play against each other for, for four and a half hours. And then after we finish, we come back into the same locker room and we sit next to each other. It's like unheard of in sport. Like everyone has separate locker rooms, like NBA, NFL, NHL. They'll have separate locker rooms. You don't see the person like hours before. I literally right. see these guys for hours and hours before the match. And we're walking out together and we walk back. It's crazy. Wow, I never knew that. Like literally, yep. I I saw you in the yep. tunnel, but I did not know that. No. We so is there locker rooms? We're all in the same locker room. We all shower together. We all eat together. It's crazy. Whoa. So, yep. what's that like? Like, are certain guys playing some little bit mental warfare in there? Like, they're keeping their yeah. distance, or really? Yeah. Some some people are really quiet in there, and some people just keep their distance. Like me, I'm always in the locker room, like with like a couple of my mates, like me and Novak or me and Andy Murray. Like, we will I'll always be quiet, like a joker in the locker room and stuff. So, people could look at that as like mental warfare too, like me just like clowning around. But there are definitely some people in there who don't give away anything. Like, they get their business done and just leave. But yeah, I mean, before Wimbledon, me and Novak just walked out of the locker room together. We walked through the tunnel. There's the royal families on the left. Like there's guards there on the right. And I'm walking in front of Novak. And I'm like a kid from Canberra who was suicidal, who was struggling with his own confidence, his own identity, is now playing in front of the royal family, walking in front of Novak to the biggest stage in world tennis. And I was like, this is nuts. And then the doors like slowly open. Every blade of grass is even. And I'm like, Nick Kyrgios isn't supposed to be here. Wow. Damn, that's yeah, cool nuts. right there, man. That's yeah, super yeah. cool. Yeah, when you're, uh, I'm really glad I asked you that. Let me ask you this. What if you don't like the guy? There's got to be a guy you don't like. Like if you're back yeah. there, it's just like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's heaps of people that I didn't get along with great in the locker room and we didn't like each other at all. But I shower next to that guy and I eat with that guy and. Uh, we just go out on court and compete for four hours. When you're in a match and you you're starting to wear a dude out, mm -hmm. right? Are there? Can you feel it? Like can you feel yeah. like he's losing it? I can. Has there been a time like that? you have to say who if you don't want to? But like, can you begin yeah. to feel? I am. He's losing his will. I'm out willing this dude right now. I'm too much for this dude right now. Is, does that happen? Can you feel it? Yeah. In Grand Slam tennis, I mean, it's best of five sets, obviously. So you can literally, my longest match I've ever played is four hours and 58 minutes. Um, like absolute battle in uh, down in Australia. But yeah, you can, I think mentally um, when you're out there for that long on your own, you've got no teammates, you've got nothing. You have some serious conversations with yourself, you know, on the change events. Like it's, it's a mental warfare. Usually people have signs physically in that long that they're starting to kind of, slow down a bit you know i've played a couple top people in five sets and i look at them and i look at them and they're looking at their team and they know that they're physically starting to slow down but i mean the lesson i learned physically was early i was 19 and i was playing the australian open um and i was one set away from winning and i wasn't physically conditioned yet to win these long matches and i full my my, my quad started cramping my whole leg started cramping up and i actually wasn't able to to play and I lost, I ended up losing the match. And I was like, that was the conversation. I I'm like, I'm never going to ever lose a match again because I'm physically not ready to, to win these long, long matches. So phys it starts with, if you're physically in good shape, I think that actually adds to your mental strength. I think people think that, oh, you got to be mentally happy first too. And I, I think it's actually incorrect. I think if, I think looking after your physical shape is, is, more important first because i think that links to you being like okay cool like i'm um, i feel good i look good and I'm, I'm ready to keep going and i feel better about myself i think phys physicality is more important in my opinion i totally i a million percent agree with you even when it comes yep. to mental health i think yep. it's hard yeah, to I talk yourself and think yourself out of a mental situation you're in i think it's a physical moving your body taking a walk as yeah, you said time. earlier 100 working out you agree with that i'm big time on people like which more important the physical or the mental that's a really hard thing but if i had yes. to pick one it would probably be to move my body physically that changes my For state sure. 
definitely but you just like yeah. if you if you feel good and you look good and you're happy with the way you you know you you, you you're just functioning i think mentally yeah. it, that's just that's just gonna that's just gonna roll on as well so hey guys as you know i've partnered up with my good friend brennan bruchard who's created the greatest personal development system that has ever been designed called growth day if you go to growthday.com forward slash ed you can get all the information but it's that time of year where everybody's trying to form new habits they've got new resolutions and goals and you need an environment and you need some coaches and you need to be able to do it super inexpensively. And that's where growthday.com forward slash ed comes in. There's everything from journaling to accountability programs, live messages every Monday from myself and other influencers. There's an opportunity for you to, to get courses that would cost thousands of dollars completely for free. It's incredible. Go to growthday.com forward slash ed and check it out. So most of the people that watch my show, they may or may not know tennis. In fact, I bet 20% know tennis. But they're all people who they're trying to make their dreams come true. They're trying to figure out how do they win, what really makes them happy. You yeah. know, would getting to the top of something truly make them happy? How do they get to the top? So let's 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 unpack that for a minute. I'm curious as to your insights about this. So you referenced Djokovic, arguably mm -hmm. the greatest ever. I'm a Federer guy, but like, you know, <laughs> there's something about the mental toughness of Djokovic that strikes me. You know, he can be down two sets, and to watch this guy come back and rattle off the next three sets, you're like, this guy's getting killed the first two sets. There's mm -hmm. something about him. And I'm curious, as your answer, because you said a god like him, but I think most people would say, talent-wise, giftedness-wise, you can hit shots that even he can't hit, that you're that type of a level of a physically gifted, talented. So, like, let's say someone's listening to this is in sales right now. They're just really good at sales, or they're really... But is yep. the separator, do you think, Nick, when it under pressure, is the love of the game? Like, when you're playing someone like that, what mm. is the difference? He's reached a potential of the most majors ever, and that doesn't seem to have been a priority for you. I'm just curious your insight. Like, what is the difference between, you know, your level of love for the game potentially under pressure and his? Do you, do you feel it when you're playing someone like that? And what are your insights about that? If you were to give someone the lesson about passion to reach their full potential, yeah. what would you say? Yeah. Well, I mean, look, I mean, we, we, we me and Djokovic, we, we played on the biggest stage in the world. You know, we played on the center court of Wimbledon um, in the biggest, probably most historic and biggest event tennis has to offer. And I feel like the one thing in my, in my experience with that three and a half hours we were on court together was just his, I felt, I almost felt the consistency of his work over the course of his career. I felt like, and I didn't like, I felt like I actually, like from a talent standpoint, I was better at it than him at tennis that, that yep. day, but I still lost. And I felt as if he didn't do anything unbelievably well that day. He just was super composed and he just, I could feel as if the whole lifetime of his work was, was involved in that match. You know, I, I won the first set and he didn't seem phased. And as you said, he's been thrown in so many different scenarios, pretty much every different scenario he's been in and he's come out on top. So his experience, he's been in some like 30 grand slam finals where that was my first one. And I felt like his ability to stay in the moment and really trust the process of, you know, this, this hot headed Australians come out hot, but, I've been here before and I've, I'm going to steady the ship and I've put the consistent work in. I feel like that for me was the biggest difference. His ability to just stay composed and, and, and have faith in the body of work that he'd put in for, for two decades. So I feel like that was the biggest separator. That's exactly why I love this man right there. You guys, what he just did His level of um, honesty and frankly, humility. It's the thing about you that I didn't see on the surface when you, I'm like, this dude's cocky. He's out. And then as I've listened to you, and some of our friends have told me, it takes great humility to say what you just said, brother, because I know you're a competitor. You know, everyone kind of just sees what they see on the court. And I'm definitely, I'll be the first to admit, like I'm psychotic and I have an obs <laughs> like obsessive personality to win and, and, and to win dirty, like I don't care. Like I was just taught in my, when I was upbringing, like losing was not accepted at all. So it was just like, you either win or you, you, or you lose. There's no like good effort or anything it's just so when i'm on court i'm two different people I'm, I'm super competitive and i'm i do twist the boundaries and i may cross the line on the court but off the court i, I don't really like i'm like two different people it's quite scary are you saying there though if someone's listening to so like i'm gonna get a lesson from a dude who's been at the top but maybe not quite reached his maximum potential yet is i want to make sure i understand what you said do you think that under pressure at the highest level of business or life 
mm-hmm. that there's a confidence that came from a dude like him where I put all this work in behind yeah. the scenes. And maybe there's yeah. a part of you in your case where you're like, I know he has, and maybe yeah. I didn't. And so under pressure, I mean, and don't, don't let me speak for you, mm-hmm. but under pressure, yeah. that, that was the confidence separator. Um, I, I, uh, definitely, um, definitely felt that, um, wow. Like as in, yeah, I mean, I, I put in the work, like I was not athletically gifted at all from a young age, like not at all. Like I was overweight. Um, and I constantly was felt insecure about, you know, my fitness levels when I was in the Academy in Australia and I, I wasn't able to, you know, pass any fitness tests. So I knew that I worked extremely hard to get there. But I think what I was thinking about, like, yeah, I, I, I was, there was a period of my life in 2019 where I, I was self-harming and suicidal and I was partying a lot and I was drinking a lot. And, um, I was also competing at the highest level, you know, against, you know, there was a night where I was out till 4am against Rafa Nadal and it was, it was a pretty dark time. So I felt like for me, it was just a bonus to get to that point, like, to make the final of Wimbledon against uh, against Djokovic was like a bonus for him. It was just like I was just another ant, like in his journey to chase a legacy and be one of the best players to ever live. Where for me, like getting there was already the bonus. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, everything I do. after that year was just like I made it out of that such a dark period of my life that now I'm like I'm in the finals of Wimbledon. Like this is what like being getting yourself out of a big mental struggle can, can lead to where for him, it was just like, he was chasing like not every person and every athlete can be like the greatest of all time. That's just not how it works. You're on the area. I want to go. I think this is the part of the interview, everybody where you share it, what we're about to talk about. Uh, I think this is where Nick helps people in ways that most people don't give him enough credit for, which is, I want to talk about mental health with you and pressure. So I watched that Netflix documentary you're in and ah, I was surprised you did grow up as a chubby kid. Right. Because I see this like dude that's got swag, you know, yeah. he's got he's got just this cachet about him. Nick does the way he moves, the way he talks. He comes across as unbelievably self-confident person. And then as I dug into it, I'm like, wow. And by the way, correct me if I'm wrong about the severity of it, but I'd like you to speak to this for a minute. Um, you actually have struggled with mental health to the extent where like you actually had an alcohol and drug thing you think you had going there for a while. Is it true that you actually played in Wimbledon after you had harmed yourself or you had to wear a wrap around your arm in a tennis match because there was some self-harming going on? And what other things have you struggled with? Is that accurate, by the way, what I just said, that that is true? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing to me, bro. That's amazing. And the world did not know that was going on. No, not at all. Um, Yeah, that that was the main thing I felt like when I was playing like at the top of the sport and and I guess living like an athlete should live at that point no one really expected me to be going through that so um yeah it was hard because I was covered my right arm was covered on like covered with it and I was playing on center court Wimbledon against Rafa Nadal and I was like I can't go out here with my arm looking like this so I, I wore like a sleeve to cover it all up um but yeah like it was just it was such a hard process because I knew I was how I was feeling internally and I didn't want to play. And I knew that I was struggling even just to wake up and, and go outside was, was a task, but then I had to like hmm. kind of just, I had the avatar that I had to live up to as well on the other side of it, where I had to go out there and play. Um, and it was, it was, it was hard. Yeah. It was really, really hard. Was there a part of you brother that you didn't want to be here anymore, that you were suicidal? Oh, definitely big, big time. Um, I felt like no one, I mean, to this day, you know, people still only really want to talk to me because, you know, Nick Kyrgios, the tennis player, the the crazy guy who does all this crazy stuff, the talented person. And it took me a while to understand that that was just a vehicle and one way of communicating who I am as a person. And then I sit down and they get to meet me and it's, it's cool. But I really struggled with the fact that I felt like my, how I was all the time, like 95% of the time wasn't enough. It was like, no one really gave a shit about who I was, um, and what I had to offer just as a normal human, it was only just about that, that guy that they saw on the court. And, you know, my family started like, you know, we grew up in a, in a pretty quiet area in Canberra. You know, we weren't, we weren't rich at all. So it was like, obviously when I started being successful, my, my family didn't really know how, you know, to, to, to approach things and how to handle things as well. So things got different in my family and it was just all bit, like it was all just a big curveball for me. Like I wasn't ready to handle that type of, success in a way and and the fame so um i really struggled with it yeah you know i uh 
I'm the blessing that I work with several athletes in different sports, golf, uh, MMA, boxers, NFL, MLB. I just working with an MLB guy now. And I got to tell the audience this because Nick is not unique in this, that at the top of everything, even in business, the pressure that comes of that can create or exaggerate mental health issues for a lot of people. It, it really can. And I, Nick, I'm sure since you've shared this, you, you would privately, we would never say who, but I bet other athletes have told you they've struggled with it as well. Yep. And it comes with it comes with the pressure of doing something great. So a lot of people listening to this, even if they haven't done that yet, they're down right now. They're they're they feel isolated and alone or misunderstood or even invisible, right? What yep. would you say to somebody who's going through a time like that or has a loved one in their life who is going through it, which by the way, I think is the majority of people, not the minority yep. of people. I think mental yep. health is a crisis right now in the world today. What what counsel words would you speak to somebody who's just they're just not feeling very good right now? Yeah, I mean, look, life, life's f***ing hard. It it's actually is brutal. Um, and I feel like um, the one thing I did that made it worse was was block people out and, and try and do it on my own. I feel like as humans with that, that's not even how we're supposed to function. You know, I think, you know, I blocked out my family. I, I didn't, I was very short with my, with my good friends that genuinely cared about my well-being, and I tried to take it alone head on and it was just worse. I just, it was like I was heading into a storm where it was never going to, the outcome was never going to be good. And I was in a um, psych ward in, in London and um, the, the day before I played Nadal and I was, they wanted me to be admitted, admitted into this place for a couple of weeks. And I was like, I can't, I have to play in Rafa Nadal at, in Wimbledon tomorrow. That's how bad it was. And then I proceeded to lose that match. It was very close. I nearly won somehow. And then, you know, I was partying for like three days st straight and I was in bed and my dad sat next to me and he was full blown crying saying, I can't see my son like this anymore. Like it was really bad. Mm -hmm. And then I basically just, I, I, you have to want to fix it. Like I knew that it was an issue. I knew that I was causing stress on my family, my friends, everyone that cared about me. And I knew that I had to fix my habits. And it started with getting up in the morning, like something small, like going for a walk, like, you know, just like really break it down into how am I going to just change? It's not going to happen overnight. It took me, it took me two years to, to reach a level where I wanted to actually wake up early in the morning and go for a walk. Like it didn't just happen overnight, but my fixing my relationship with my family, my friends, you know, I've got an incredible partner now who's super supportive of me and we have a great relationship. Um, and it, it stemmed like I had, I was in a, my last relationship, my partner, it was so toxic and that was also feeding into it. Like you just, I can't put enough um, emphasis on the closest five people around you have to be incredibly positive and, and want the best out of you. And they might make you feel uncomfortable sometimes in the sense like holding you accountable or like wanting you to improve to a sense of being uncomfortable sometimes. But those are the only people I have around me now. And if they see me slipping back into these habits of, of doing some drugs or any of this type of stuff, like, every now and then like they hold me accountable because they know that a personality like me can slip back into these dark habits and, and, and it's not fun. So. Wow, bro. I'm like blown away. I, this is real. Just so you know, when tennis is over, this is your calling. Like <laughs> part of what you should be doing is this right here, impacting people's lives because I don't know if you all under, hear what he just said. He, he was in a psych ward the night before he's playing Rafa Nadal, like Rafa Nadal. That's insane to me. And so if he can come from where he did and make improvements, and by the way, I think you'd acknowledge this. I, by the way, have struggled with when to quit something. I'm reading, a, I'm actually, I can't, I can't remember the title of the book, but I'm actually reading a book about right now. It's essentially, it's how do you know when to quit or quitting? Mm. And for me, it's physical health. I'm just doing too many things that have impacted my, my life physically to the point where something has to go away, right? And this yep. is in my life. I'm being real honest with everybody here today. And that's affected, you know, different areas of my life. I wonder if you've navigated that question, like, when is it okay to quit? You know, when yeah. is it okay to take a break? And how do you know that? And, and it's one of the great questions in life, you know, is that we're always climbing for more and more and more. Yep. And sometimes I think you have to audit whether your original dream is your dream anymore, you yeah. know, I, uh... and if you're going about it the right way. I'm just curious your thoughts about that. You're smiling. I mean, that's, that's, it's just like, I guess that's the common kind of struggle that 
I guess you've dealt with it. I've dealt with it. And I actually asked, you know, Gary this, Jay Shetty this, Gordon Ramsay, all of these amazingly successful people that have insane work ethics, by the way. Like, and I go to them, yeah. do you ever just like sit back and, and actually just pause for a second and see what you've achieved and what you've done. And, and, and none of them like say like, no, they just do it. And then they don't even like have time to appreciate what they do. They just go to the next thing and they do it. And I'm just like, and I sit there internally and I'm like, man, that's just like, when's enough enough as in like, you know, you've probably got enough money to be good for, for, for your future generation. It's just like now, like, but you just, there's something inside you. I'm sure it's the same with you. You just want to like go to, you want to wake up tomorrow and keep going to the gym. Like you want to stay motivated. And, and I just don't know, like if work-life balance exists, like I don't have the answers for this question because it's like well, the more successful or the more things I achieve or the more things I'm able to dabble in and I want to do more. And it's just like, I don't know, it's an addiction. I, I, I'm not sure. I don't have the answers for it. So I can't help you with yeah. that one. Well, I'm but addicted I'm learning, to the expansion yeah. of my being. I, I'm addicted yeah. to the expansion of my being. I think... I don't even think you have to have the answer. The reason I asked it to you is I think it's powerful to ask yourself the question though. And yep. just contemplating in your life, you know, is this where I want to be? Is this what I want to continue yep. to do? And I think that's a healthy thing. I think sometimes we think it's a weakness to ask. It's a weakness mm. to inquire. I'm 53 yep. years old in a month. I've made, you know, lots of money in my life. I've had the ability to achieve a lot of different things. Yeah. There is a point in your life where priorities change. And, I, yes. and it's just worth checking in with yourself. Are these still exactly. my priorities? I think is the question. And it's, it's different for every single person. And I wanted to ask you that today because it's something that I know a lot of people ask themselves. It's true in the relationship they're in. It's true in the business they've started. It could be in a yeah. sport that they're in. I get asked this by athletes all the time. And you don't yeah. want to ever get at, outside of something and go, man, I could have gotten more out of that. I regret I didn't go a little bit more. Yeah. Right? There's a part of I that. Agree. So hey guys, if you're like me, I am always on the lookout to try to eliminate these cold and flu symptoms. I gotta tell you, literally right now, as I'm recording this, the last three or four days, I was struggling. I've had a cough, I've been congested. I tried an IV, I went and did a bunch of vitamin C. I've tried about everything under the sun. None of it has been working. Bam, someone sends me Armra colostrum and it has changed everything. Here's the kicker, in clinical trials, bovine colostrum was found to be at least three times more effective than the flu vaccine at preventing the flu. So here's our special offer. We've worked out a special offer for my audience. Receive 15% off your first order. Go to tryarmra.com slash mylet. That's T-R-Y-A-R-M-R-A dot com slash mylet. Or enter mylet to get 15% off your first order. That's tryarmra.com. T-R-Y-A-R-M-A dot com slash mylet. These statements and products have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease or condition. These statements and information are not a substitute for or alternative to seeking care from your health care providers. There's a part of me, though, that I've also struggled with as I've climbed higher and higher. There's been a, I think I just, I'm the, I'm the son of an alcoholic. And so I think I've always struggled with a little bit of imposter syndrome in the sense that I'm sort of... That. Do you? Yeah, just I'm like I never, I never feel like I never feel like I'd like it's very strange for me to even be talking to you or something. Like I just, I don't feel as if I don't take myself seriously at all in the sense like I just, yeah, I feel like every every time I'm in a room with someone that's you know have, have achieved something great or like I, I don't feel like I deserve to be there either. I don't know. It's a weird feeling. Hmm. What do you think it comes from? Being a heavy kid? Do you think it's how you grew up? Yeah, I I think so. I mean, I I just. The only reason I ever wanted to start playing tennis and, and, and become one of the best was just to show that an average person like me, like an overweight kid that lived in Canberra, Australia, was able to go out there and, and beat some of the greatest of all time. That's all I wanted to show. I just wanted to show that an average person, like if you really just put your mind to something, you can you can do it. That's it. That was, my, that was my goal. you yourself a little bit with that belief, Nick? Like, do you think there's been some sabotaging unconsciously that – took place either whether whether your preparation or something on the court or just a thought when you're out there, if you're being honest, that um affected your performance based on that imposter syndrome? Um, I, I think so. I think if I was a bit more like honestly, if I was a bit more selfish and I was a bit more like, I guess, more orientated to doing the best for my career, my training and not like helping other people or, or being there for others as much. 
I definitely feel like I could have had way more success in my career, but that success doesn't outweigh for me the success. Like yesterday, two days ago, I had a foundation day in, in my hometown and there was a, over 1,200 kids in, in my like tennis center that I grew up in. Like for me, that success outweighs the success of winning a Grand Slam because and, and being more selfish and being more like involved in my own career because one of the best things when I opened up about my self-harming and, and my suicidal thoughts was the amount of people that messaged me on social media that I've, you know, got their numbers now, I stay in contact with, I call wow. them. And it's like that for me has been the most powerful thing in my career. It's not about the trophies. It's about, and that's my point. I think that's the answer of why, when, when are we going to stop? When are we going to quit? I think you shouldn't because of all these things that you're doing and achieving and, and your platform and you're growing, you're being, you're, you're, you're just spreading your awareness of helping others. And I think that is for me, like that's what keeps me going, to be honest, like me being able to show up for two hours at a tennis center and kids are going crazy and gets them to want to be active and play tennis. And who cares about if they're good or not? It's if the fact that they feel like they, they mean something for that little period of time. I had Deion Sanders on a few weeks ago, Coach Prime. And he was talking about a stage of his life where he was suicidal, believe it or not. I mean, maybe the greatest defensive player to ever play football, right? And he was talking about, you know, he had had, he had, had everything he wanted. He had a bunch of money. He had, yep. you know, the mansion. He had the success. He had yep. all these things. And he said, and then I just was miserable. Yep. And I said, the power in sharing that, and this is a lesson for everybody, as I said, in life, we're most qualified to help the person we used to be. And if you're willing to share, this is who I used to be, or even I'm him sometimes still, but I'm yep. in a, I'm a work in progress. Being willing to reveal your imperfections with people 100%. is what really connects with you. And to be honest with you, I'm a big fan of Federer. I'm a big fan. I loved Bjorn Borg when he played and, and you know, I, a huge tennis fan, but there's something about you and your vulnerability and your authenticity that connects me with you differently, yeah. that they're not, you're not Superman. You're a real man. No, not. Yeah, and yeah. and yeah. and to me that you've stumbling on to the greatest part of your life right now, bro. And the other people that are listening to this, if you're willing to be vulnerable and authentic with who you really are, whatever you whatever you really believe in, whatever you really stand for, whatever your fears are, your weaknesses, your failures, your shortcomings, you're gonna find that the more you reveal that, the more you connect with people, and the more that Definitely. you can help them, and, and, and the more that you you improve as well. Like you you improve. Like there's no like I, I go into places sometimes and I, I the, 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 the person I'm in the room with can be rich, powerful, whatever, famous, but they're not willing to even just admit where they have flaws. And and I just know like he's stunting the growth of becoming more of, of who he is as a person. And I just like, I love it. Like when I'll be the first, like people think, like I love it for the first people, people think that I'm like super confident all the time, like whatever, all these great things. And I'm like, bro, they're like, that's not me at all. Like, I, this is what I'm good at. These are my points where I can improve on. And that's how you can, you just said it, that's how you connect with people. And, and that's, why, that's why I love doing these things now because I think people are starting to understand that I'm completely different for how, you know, the image has been painted out for so long. The thing that worries me is when you have somebody who's already struggling with their self-belief, this is, this is you here, I want you to talk about this. So you're already struggling. Like when I was coming up in business, I already... My main struggle was working on me to the point where I believed in myself enough so that I could achieve. I always say that your your identity, and I've watched this with yeah. you, brother. I think you'll relate to this. Your identity, your self-worth, the things you really truly believe about yourself, it's like a thermostat setting on your life. So like in the theater right now in my studio, it's, it's 72 degrees in here. And what yeah. happens in life that if your results start to heat up past what you believe in yourself, so you get 80, 90, 95, you subconsciously turn the air conditioners on of your life and cool it back down to what you believe you're worth. Mm. And I really believe in your case, like this is a man with 150 degrees worth of ability and potential, but there's this kid in there still that sometimes is at 72 and 75 degrees and that thermostat setting comes back on. So I spent most of my time working on that. I still work on it. And when you lump onto that person who's already struggling, so it's a lot of people listening to this, they're already struggling with their self-belief and then they have criticism mm. in your case, like flat out haters. So that combination yeah. is like for me coming up, it was the worst possible comment. I'm already trying to increase my thermostat setting. I'm not one of these yeah. naturally confident guys. Right. So I'm yeah. already working on that. And then you heap onto me yeah, some brutal. form of criticism. It was like massively 
difficult combination for me. Yeah. And then in your case, it's public criticism. Yes, man. So it's how do you my life how do you deal bit. with that, brother? Because you're already struggling internally as this guy who's like, man, I'm this heavy set kid. I'm from a regular place. I'm an average dude. Yeah. I'm and then now there's criticism and haters educate us on how you have tried to deal with that and what advice you would give to any human being who's dealing. It might even just be their boyfriend or girlfriend. Like you can't do this. What's wrong with yeah, you? Why yeah, are you trying yeah. to I mean, change? Yeah. It could be family. It could be anyone close to you. I mean, like I don't think my family genuinely believed that I was going to be one of the best tennis players in the world from like, just, I don't think it's realistic. Like they were programmed to think like that. And that's why you, myself, we, we do achieve because there's a part of us like, oh, what if, like, what if we do push the boundaries a little bit? What if we do, you know, ask the question. Um, but I mean, this day, this day and age for me is, is very hard because like I'm a bit old school in the sense like social media and all of these things that are happening now, like for me, like, like all, like I wake up and I can go on my Instagram and I see thousands of negative comments and like, I don't really take them personally, but subconsciously they're going into my head and, when things get tough, like when I'm about to do this gym session, like in here, it's like we go to the point of failure. It's like I start thinking about, oh, like, am I this? Am I this? Like, it, and it beats you down so much. Like, that's what I struggled with in 2019. Like, it got to a point where I actually started believing these comments. And then I started hating myself. And I, I was waking up in Shanghai playing a tournament at like 3 p.m. I played night and I would literally was waking up to like alcohol. Like, I wasn't even drinking. Like, it was just to the point of like, I hated myself and I started just believing all these people I didn't even know what these people look like but I started believing the comments and now I, I have to seriously like every day really invest in just like not feeding into and not even trying to read it and just trying to like self-affirmations like trying to tell myself like I'm a good dude like I'm, I, I train hard like I really put an effort in that and people will maybe watch this and say like oh, I'm not going to do that but it goes such a long way but now I, I wake up I try and like you know, just that, like have just positive words because words, words are words can kill can kill people in this day and age. That's how brutal it is. Like I've seen people like su like commit suicide just because of what someone said to them and, and 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 what they see on social media and these all this comparison and it's 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 really bad. By the way, I want everyone to hear that words can kill people. I can tell you definitively in my work because of all the messages that I get from different people around the world. That is a fact. Please extend more kindness to one another. Please be careful of heaping criticism on to somebody, deserving or undeserving. Um, you could be contributing to something so harmful in somebody's life. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I strongly urge everybody just to extend a little bit more grace and a little bit more kindness to people. Hey, guys, so I'm hearing from so many of you right now about how tight money can be. You know, you end up filling up your gas tank, you go to the grocery store, everything after that, for some of you, it's you're swiping the credit card just to pay for things. I got a message the other day from a lady on social media who said to me, she goes, I end up having more month than I have money. And so I know some of you can really relate to that. Now, the good news is interest rates have dropped into the fives again for the most part, which is a lot lower than credit cards. And so if you're swiping that credit card, I think maybe American Financing can give you some help. Right now, they've saved about $854 a month or about ten grand per customer They've been saving on average right now. So give them a try. Call 888-995-2440, 888-995-2440, or visit AmericanFinancing.net, NMLS 182-334, NMLSConsumerAccess.org. APR for rates in the five start at 6.406% for well-qualified borrowers. Call 888-995-2440 for details about credit costs and terms. Brother, your work is profound, what you're doing now. And I'm wondering, in your career, if you look back, since you're so honest, is there something particularly that you're proud of? And is there something particularly that you, you know, you really regret? What's the thing you're really, really proud of? And then what's the thing, if you looked back so far, that you regret? I'm, I'm proud of the way I've been able to provide for my family and and my friend, like my friends and, and my partner. Like, that's for me... I think as a man, that was my main goal. Like when I was young, I watched my family struggle with with bills. We had no no money to kind of do anything. Um, and now I'm able to, you know, make them all, you know, enjoy their life. And then there's no stress of that. And, and everyone's just, I think, really happy in my household. And when I take my friends out to dinner, I'm, I'm, I'm 
I'm very lucky that I'm able to take care of them and my partner lives a great life. So I think for me, that's what I'm most proud of. I'm, I'm most proud of that I've taken the pressure off my family. That's um, awesome. That's like, and I feel like that's what you should be most proud of. Like every, like everyone that's really like out here grinding and, and waking up early and doing this, like that's the main goal. It's like you're, that, that's what people are hating on on social media that they probably can't, they're not able to take care of their people like you take care of your people. And that's what, that's what, that's what I've broken it down to. It's like, how can someone call me like any sort of names or, or you didn't achieve this, you didn't do this. It's like, bro, I'm able to take care of my people the best I can, I can do. Like that's mm. so, so sick. Um, yeah. and regret, I mean, I've thought about this for so long, like, or things I would do differently and change, but I think the more I reflect on it, I don't think I regret anything in my career because I think the person I am today, and as you said, like, I'm thinking I'm trying transitioning and stepping into the best part of my life now with all my, my hands in different sort of areas. And it's not just tennis and it's really exciting. And I've waken up with all different types of stimulation. I'm here talking to you and, it's just so cool. And I don't think if anything changed prior to this moment, I don't think, I don't know if it would be the same. So I don't think there's time to regret anything. I think like you can say like, oh, maybe that wasn't the right decision and I didn't move in the right direction. But mm. I don't think you would take that away because I've, I've f***ed up so many times and I've made the worst decision possible. Not even a bad decision, like the worst possible decision in, in <laughs> at times. Um, and I'm still managed to navigate through all of it and be here and, and you know have good habits now and that's what i'm saying like I, I don't think i regret anything to be honest you uh the other thing that people deal with is um by the way what a great conversation like i'm really grateful we're doing this i'm really really, really cool. grateful all these years i've watched you and then um i introduced you this way and i mean it there's a depth and a dimension to you that's really compelling and uh i'm just really impressed with you the uh the other thing that you've had to deal with that people deal with in different ways, mm. and this is a real thing in life, I did, it's other people's expectations. So mm. like in my case, I went to college and I remember when I decided to become an entrepreneur, the disappointment kind of on my dad's face initially. Like he loved me, but it was almost like he was so worried for me, you know, that I had made this particular choice. So it yep. was the expectations, almost like I had disappointed my dad with the choices that I made. And I just, you know, I never wanted to disappoint. It wasn't that my dad was a hater by no means. It was I think yep. in life, sometimes you have to distinguish between people who are genuinely concerned for you, even if they're wrong, yep. and someone mm -hmm. who's antagonistic towards you, right? In my yep. dad's case, he wasn't antagonistic. He's my dad. But he was certainly concerned and disappointed. And I remember thinking, man, I've my dad's expectations, I've let him down. I think a lot of people, their spouse has certain expectations, their family has certain expectations, their friends are used to them being a particular way. And man, in your case, I don't know that there's been a lot of athletes that had more expectations poured onto them than you. Yep. And that's something really to deal with, to escape that, to navigate that. It's one of the keys to becoming a blissful human being. Is other people, yeah, it's almost it's, like, in your case, I think no matter how much you had won, people would have expected enough. more winning, right? It would yeah. never be enough. So how would how do you recommend people deal with other people's expectation? And am I right that you had to deal with that? Well, I think you just, it just, yeah, you, you never can please anyone. I guess everyone's going to know this. Like, everyone's going to have opinions. Like, in my eyes now, I think I've had a really good career. Like, there's only been a couple hundred human beings in, since the beginning of time that I made a Grand Slam final. And like, if I look about the chances of me doing it, it was so slim and now I've done it. So like, I'm not going to sit here and talk about achievements and stuff, but I feel like, yeah, I mean, I wake up still to this day and I haven't achieved enough or curiosity is the biggest waste of talent to ever touch a tennis tracker. Like that's, a, that's something that I've literally dealt with every single day for the last 15 years of my life. Like since I touched the tennis tracker and I was on tour, I continually deal with it. So um yeah you just have to go back to the basics and, and think like am i trying to still move in the right direction like yes i'm trying to train hard i'm trying to eat well i'm trying to maintain a level of lifestyle where i'm even going to improve i'm still looking to improve in different areas um and it's just it's hard because i know that my family wants me to continue to play for a couple more years and and, and have a year where i'm competing for grand slams like i know that my fans want me to win grand slams and i know that i'm if I look myself in the mirror, like my chance to win a Grand Slam is slim. It's possible, but 
if I don't win a Grand Slam, I've already had a conversation with myself. I'm okay with that. I know I'm a good person. I know that I try my best in like helping other people. And if I don't win a Grand Slam, that's fine. I'm not going to let that define me. But I know that I've already accepted that people are going to be disappointed. Like if I don't win one, everyone around me will be disappointed. Um, and it's just, you just have to be okay with it. Like as long as you're okay with the path you're on, that's all that matters. Because I, I already know that at the end of my career, there's going to be a lot of disappointed people. Hmm. That's a really profound thing. You, um, I'm on this thing right now I'm speaking about. And I, I, I think of certain people when I describe this and you're one of them. I have this theory that the reason I always say conformity is the, it's, I didn't make this up by the way. I heard it somewhere years ago, but conformity is the ultimate form of cowardice, meaning conforming to what the world expects you to be, be a particular way. is sort of a cowardly approach to life. And I think we're taught this as kids to kind of color within the lines. You know, that was one of the things you're taught in school. And I'm talking a lot about this on stage right now. Color within the lines. Don't go outside the lines. That's a bad thing. And I remember I'm so uncoordinated and I'm left-handed that I could never color like the other kids. I was always yes. outside the lines a little bit. You look at old pictures of me in like kindergarten, it's like, my gosh, it's terrible. And as I've gotten older, I'm like, actually, that's one of my great traits is I don't color within the lines. I've decided to have a life that doesn't color outside within the lines like everybody else. And if you think about someone in sports <laughs> who is not always colored within the lines, and maybe sometimes to his own detriment, but it's yep. you. I want you to talk about it because, like, do you are you intentionally that way? You think you were born like I? I'm not a conformist. I'm not, yep. and a lot of hate comes with it. A lot of criticism comes with it. But you are really a dude who does not color within the lines in your life. And I think that I actually think those are usually the people in life we admire. Martin Luther King didn't color within the lines, right? He didn't color within the lines. You think of someone that's a hero of yours, if you're a person of faith, like they didn't color within the lines. They 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 went outside of what everybody's expectations mm -hmm. or what the norm is. They weren't part of the pack. People in the yeah. pack seem to never really accomplish very much in life. So I'm just yeah, wondering well, your thoughts on that. Well, yeah, you asked me, have, do I intentionally try to color outside lines no like one of my childhood friends like we literally grew up since seven years old from my hometown and he's i was exactly the same way at that age that i am today the way i play tennis i'm on the court i'm very emotional i wear my heart on my sleeve like emotions like i used to cry on court as a little kid like when i was losing like i was always very emotional on court and i guess someone like me i was already against the eight ball you know with tennis tennis is all very white old traditional like sport where it's very respectful it's a gentleman's game people used to wear vests on court um and i feel like if i was thrown into like an nba sort of um team or you know we have rugby in in australia like i would be probably one of the nicest guys on court i wouldn't like do anything crazy i'd probably the curious would be like oh he's like he's he's a softy he's he's not one to worry about if i played any other sport because it's tennis it's like oh this guy is an abomination because i walk differently and i dress differently and i speak differently and i wear a red jordan hat at wimbledon it's like oh my god this guy is he's a criminal <laughs> so it's right. like um i guess i was always seen to be a person that really is against the grain which, which i am i'm not i wouldn't say i'm like I, I, i'm like I'm, I'm a rule breaker for sure but i'm not like someone who's crazy crazy like there are people in australia who will just walk past me and they'll be their mouth will be on the ground waiting for me to do something crazy like that's how bad this whole media thing has gotten they think that i'm a nutcase like they'll just look yeah. at me and be like do something like do something crazy um but no i think me playing tennis and the way i am that created the kind of thing that i was just like i wasn't even coloring the page they want me to color i was doing something else I think that's why you can actually make mistakes and not have regrets. I think the regrets at the end of the life is someone who just colored within the lines the whole time and goes, man, I blew it. I yeah, never found scared. out who I was. They're scared to take the chance. They're scared to do something that is against the grain because that's where the best things happen in my life. Like nothing, nothing good in my life has actually come. And by, by like sticking to a plan that someone else gave me, like mm -hmm. I made the decision of doing something crazy um, or like, doing something spontaneous or instinctively that's where all my best successes come and that's that's just i don't know if 
it's a dangerous word of advice for everyone to do it because I think like it doesn't work for everyone too. Some people need to be measured and have a nice plan and have goals. I think that works as well. But for my personality, my best moments have come um, just doing things instinctively. Okay, two more things. Last two things. The other thing people don't know about tennis, and I watched you uh, in that Wimbledon when you ended up in the finals against Djokovic. I just wanted to be in I, – I wanted to ask you this while I was watching it. So the other thing most people don't know is you have a team in a box that's up there, right? And yep. even in matches that you were winning, yep. I was watching you sort of like – I thought, at least it looked to me, like kind of yelling up there at them a little bit, right? Giving him, giving him some – yeah, I was wondering, is that what you're doing? Are you trying to fire yourself up? Are they are they yeah. giving you instructions that you don't want? Like because people that usually win have a team. They may be in their office, maybe somewhere else, but like yours mm. is like right yep. there in the box. You just yep. you know, you didn't win a you didn't win a game or you missed a forehand yep. or the backhand. Yep. And I'm watching you and other players seem to be like kind of calm yep. when they're doing that. That's yep. their formula. You look like yep. Yeah, yeah. Were you yelling yeah. at them, yelling at yourself? Like what's happening then with you and your team? So we, so, I mean, I, I'm very, I'm very talkative on the court. Like other players, they don't like to talk, they like to get in their zone. But for me, an outlet of pressure is having conversations with people that I know I've put in like a decade of work in and their insight to me is very important. Like I don't always like to, if I'm in the heat of the moment, they might see something from that view that could be worth something to me. So I'll always ask them like, say something to me, like, as in like what you're seeing, like just say, say anything it could be anything to just take my mind off what I could be think I could be missing something. And then like we have, I mean, look at times, like I'm just talking just an outlet pressure. Like I'll say something that's not even relevant to tennis and they just look at each other like, why is he talking about that right now? They're like, this guy's got serious <laughs> mental issues on the court. Um, and then we get off the court, they're like, you're nuts. And I'm like, yeah, no, I'm so sorry. Like, that wasn't even me. I don't even know who that person was. But um, mm. yeah, these are these are my like my childhood friends, my agent now. Like, we went to school together. You know, my physio, my physiotherapist, who've been, you know, working together for almost 11 years. He's in the gym with me every day. Like, these are my people that we've literally like created this whole journey with so like i i just want to win so bad not only for me but for them too like i want my whole team to and then ultimately the better i do the better that they do as well so it's like i just want us all to have success basically i love you this is so good um so a couple things guys follow nick on social media he's also got a new good show trouble. out that he's doing what's the name of the show nick good trouble it's called good trouble good trouble good trouble Check right that out. he's already had a fit right in yeah, I'll be on there for you, brother. And he's got yeah, a bunch of you. great guests on there already that he's been yep. telling me about. So go check that out. Last question. I got a friend named Tim yep. Grover. I'm sure you know who Tim is. He worked yep. with Jordan and Kobe. Yep. And I've had other athletes. And athletes will ask me this. In fact, I just had a UFC guy here last week. And he's like, you know, I'm debating whether to, I'll call it the Evander Holyfield, come into the ring and peace and worship music's playing and I'm going to leverage the light. That's my mm -hmm. motivation, my dream, the light, my vision. Or am I coming in there like Kobe or, you know, the Black Mamba, and I'm going to leverage what Tim calls the dark side, almost like leveraging yep. pain, going to that dark place to win. I'm curious in your case what works for you and what you would recommend to other people. Are you more of a, like, chase the light and the thrill of victory type guy and the vision if we win the dream? Or are you, like, mm -hmm. kind of leveraging that dark stuff? I'm a fat kid. They don't think I've got this. Yep. You know, I'm the guy who always screws off. I'm the guy who doesn't yep. reach his potential. I'll show you, blah, blah, blah. Which one do you yeah, leverage? I, I mean, I think I, I definitely get more into a competitive zone if I'm thinking about the dark energy that's been thrown my way. I kind of like – I love proving people wrong. and I love, um, you know, spoiling someone's day or, or, or really trying to – you know, play the villain role going out there in front of, you know, I played Roger and I played Rafa, I played Novak and I was always the villain. Like I played them all around the world and I never had the crowd on my side. So I guess I've kind of been thrown into that energy already. I didn't really have a choice. So I had to hone in on like, right, no one in this stadium wants me to win. Like there's 50,000 people in there all chanting Roger's name and I got goosebumps for him. So I'm like, F that I'm going in there and I'm going to like, I'm going to be the, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to screw this story up. So that's how I am big time. I got news for you, man. The more people see these interviews, that's going to change. And they're going to be rude for want you. To. I want them, I want I know them to you don't. Like I know. You're going to have a problem because you're too likable and you're too good of a man. Uh, who's the GOAT? 
Federer, Djokovic, Sorry, Borg, I'm Nadal. I don't you got to pick one, man. You can't. I don't know if you want me to answer this, bro. It's not. I'm, I want you to answer it. I want no. I want the real truth. Who who is Novak? It's Novak. Djokovic. Novak is. Yeah. yeah. And you play Sorry, against all three. Guy. Yeah. What's that? I know that you're a Federer guy, but it's Novak. It is Novak. Okay, everybody, you heard it here first. That's going to make a TMZ Sports for sure, right there. <laughs> but I always wanted. You've been on the court, so you would know. You've played against them. Um, yeah. For me, in terms of helping people, you're the new goat of tennis because you're contributing to people's Thank lives, you. and I want you to get healthy physically. I know mentally you're that. improving and growing, and I yeah. and I'm here to help you any way I can. When we get offline here, I'm going to give you my Thank number. You. And uh, you. man, I love you. I'm impressed with you, and you made a big difference in people's lives today, bro. Thank you. We did it together. Appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. All right, everybody. God bless you. Max out your life. Share this episode. <laughs> <laughs>